59. Squid. Slowly wading through the meadows of Brit, the Pequod still held on her way northeastward towards the island of Java, a gentle air impelling her keel, so that in the surrounding serenity her three tall tapering masts mildly waved to that languid breeze as three mild palms on a plain. And still, at wide intervals, in the silvery night, the lonely alluring jet would be seen. But one transparent blue morning, when a stillness almost preternatural spread over the sea, however unattended with any stagnant calm, when the long burnished sun glade on the waters seemed a golden finger laid across them, enjoining some secrecy, when the slippered waves whispered together as they softly ran on, in the profound hush of the visible sphere a strange spectre was seen by Dagu from the main masthead. In the distance, a great white mass lazily rose, and rising higher and higher, and disentangling itself from the azure, at last gleamed before our prow like a snow-slide, new slid from the hills. Thus glistening for a moment, as slowly it subsided and sank. Then one more arose and silently gleamed. It seemed not a whale, and yet, is this Moby Dick? thought Dagu. Again the phantom went down, but on reappearing once more, with a stiletto-like cry, that startled every man from his nod, the negro yelled out, There! There again! There she breaches! Right ahead! The white whale! The white whale! Upon this the seamen rushed to the yard-arms, as in swarming time the bees rushed into the bows. Bareheaded in the sultry sun, Ahab stood on the bowsprit, and with one hand pushed far behind in readiness to wave his orders to the helmsman, cast his eager glance in the direction indicated aloft by the outstretched motionless arm of Dagu. Whether the flitting attendants of the one still and solitary jet had gradually worked upon Ahab, so that he was now prepared to connect the ideas of mildness and repose with the first sight of the peculiar whale he pursued. However this was, or whether his eagerness betrayed him, whichever way it might have been, no sooner did he distinctly perceive the white mass than with a quite with a quick intensity, he instantly gave orders for lowering. The four boats were soon on the water, Ahab's in advance, and all swiftly pulling towards their prey. Soon it went down, and while with oars suspended, we were awaiting its reappearance, lo, in the same spot where it sank, once more it slowly rose, almost forgetting, for the moment, all thoughts of Moby Dick. We now gazed at the most wondrous phenomenon, which the secret seas have hitherto revealed to mankind, a vast pulpy mass, furlongs in length and breadth, of a glancing cream color, lay floating on the water, innumerable long arms radiating from its center, and curling and twisting like a nest of anacondas, as if blindly to clutch at any hapless object within reach. No perceptible face or front did it have, no conceivable token of either sensation or instinct, but undulated there on the billows an unearthly, formless, chance-like apparition of life. As with a low, sucking sound, it slowly disappeared again. Starbuck, still gazing at the agitated waters where it had sunk with a wild voice exclaimed almost rather had i seen moby deck 
and fought him than to have seen thee, thou white ghost. What was it, sir? said Flask. The great live squid, which they say few whale ships ever beheld, and returned to their ports to tell of it. But Ahab said nothing. Turning his boat, he sailed back to the vessel, the rest as silently following. Whatever superstitions the sperm whalesmen in general have connected with the sight of this object, certain it is that a glimpse of it being so very unusual that circumstance has gone far to invest it with portentousness. So rarely is it beheld that though one and all of them declare it to be the largest animated thing in the ocean, yet very few of them have any but the most vague ideas concerning its true nature and form, notwithstanding they believe it to furnish to the sperm whale his only food. For though other species of whales find their food above water, and may be seen by man in the act of feeding, the spermaceti whale obtains his whole food in unknown zones, below the surface, and only by inference it is that any one can tell of what precisely that food consists. At times when closely pursued, he will disgorge what are supposed to be the detached arms of the squid, some of them thus exhibited exceeding twenty and thirty feet in length. They fancy that the monster to which these arms belonged ordinarily clings by them to the bed of the ocean, and the sperm whale, unlike other species is supplied with teeth in order to attack and tear it. There seems some ground to imagine that the great kraken of Bishop Pontopoden may ultimately resolve itself into squid. The manner in which the bishop describes it, as alternately rising and sinking with some other particulars he narrates, in all this the two correspond, but much abatement is necessary with respect to the incredible bulk he assigns it. By some naturalists, who have vaguely heard rumors of the mysterious creature here spoken of, it is included among the class of cuttlefish to which indeed, in certain external respects, it would seem to belong, but only as the anak of the tribe. Sixty. The Line With reference to the whaling scene shortly to be described, as well as for the better understandings of all similar scenes elsewhere presented, I have here to speak of the magical, sometimes horrible, whale line. The line originally used in the fishery was of the best hemp, slightly vapored with tar, not impregnated with it, as in the case of ordinary ropes, for while tar, as ordinarily used, makes the hemp more pliable to the rope maker, and also renders the rope itself more convenient to the sailor for common ship use, yet not only would the ordinary quantity too much stiffen the whale line for the close coiling to which it must be subjected. But as most seamen are beginning to learn, tar in general by no means adds to the rope's durability or strength, however much it may give it compactness and gloss. Of late years, the manila rope has in the American fishery almost entirely superseded hemp as a material for whale lines, for though not so durable as hemp, it is stronger and far more soft and elastic, and I will add, since there is an aesthetic in all things, is much more handsome and becoming to the boat than hemp. Hemp is a dusky dark fellow, a sort of Indian, but Manila is 
as a golden-haired Caracassian to behold. The whale line is only two-thirds of an inch in thickness. At first sight, you would not think it so strong as it really is. By experiment, it's one and fifty yarns will each suspend a weight of 120 pounds, so that the whole rope will bear a strain nearly equal to three tons. In length, the common sperm whale line measures something over 200 fathoms. Towards the stern of the boat, it is spirally coiled away in the tub, not like the worm pipe of a still, though, but so as to form one round, cheese-shaped mass of densely bedded sheaves, or layers of concentric spiralizations, without any hollow, but the heart or minute vertical tube formed at the axis of the cheese. As the least tangle or kink in the coiling would, in running out, infallibly take somebody's arm, leg, or entire body off, the utmost precaution is used in stowing the line in its tub. Some harpooners will consume almost an entire morning in the business carrying the line high aloft and then reeving it downwards through a block towards the tub so as the so as in the act of coiling to free it from all possible wrinkles and twists really dude i'm sorry people but i just have to say this i don't want to read about fucking rope but anyway <laughs> In the English boats, two tubs are used instead of one, the same line being continuously coiled in both tubs. There is some advantage in this, because these twin tubs, being so small, they fit more readily into the boat, and do not strain in so much, whereas the American tub, nearly three feet in diameter, and of proportionate depth, makes a rather bulky freight for... <clears throat> for a craft whose planks are but one half inch in thickness, for the bottom of the whaleboat is like critical ice, which will bear up a considerable distributed weight, but not a very much of a concentrated, con concentrated one. When the painted canvas cover is clasped on the American line tub, the boat looks as if it were pulling off with a prodigious great wedding cake to present to the whales. But ends of the line are exposed, the lower end terminating in an eye splice or loop coming up from the bottom against the side of the tub and hanging over its edge, completely disengaged from everything. This arrangement of the lower end is necessary on two accounts. First, in order to facilitate the fastening to it of an additional line from a neighboring boat in case of the str Stricken whale should sound so deep as to threaten to carry off the entire line originally attached to the harpoon. In these instances, the whale, of course, is shifted like a mug of ale, as it were, from the one boat to the other, though the first boat always hovers at hand to assist its consort. Second, this arrangement is indispensable for common safety's sake, for were the lower end of the line in any way attached to the boat, and were the whale then to run the line out to the end almost in a single smoking minute, as he sometimes does, he would not stop there, for the doomed boat would infallibly be dragged down after him into the profundity of the sea, and in that case no town crier would ever find her again. Before lowering the boat for the chase, the upper end of the line is taken aft from the tub, and passing around the loggerhead there, is again carried forward the entire length of the boat, resting crosswise upon the loom or handle of every man's oar, so that it jogs against his wrist in rowing and also passing between the men, as they alternately sit at the opposite gunwales to the leaded 
chocks or grooves in the extreme pointed prow of the boat where a wooden pin or skewer the size of a common quill prevents it from slipping out from the chocks it hangs in a slight festoon over the bows and is then passed inside the boat again and some ten or twenty fathoms called box line being coiled upon the box in the bows it continues its way to the gunwale still a little farther aft and is then attached to the short warp the rope which is immediately connected with the harpoon but previous to the connection the short warp goes through sundry mystifications too tedious to detail well why not you've gone this far sorry <laughs> i'm sorry it's just like <clears throat> anyway thus the whale line folds the whole boat in its complicated coils twisting and writhing around it in almost every direction all the oarsmen are involved in its perilous contortions contortions so that to the timid eye of the landsmen they seem as indian jugglers with the deadliest snakes sportively festooning their limbs nor can any sign of mortal woman for the first time seat himself amid those hempen intricacies and while straining his utmost at the oar bethink him that at any unknown instant the harpoon may be darted and all these horrible contortions be put in play like ring lightnings he cannot be thus circumstanced without a shudder that makes the very marrow in his bones to quiver in him like a shaken jelly yet habit strange thing what cannot habit accomplish guyer sallies more merry mirth better jokes and brighter repartees you never heard over cedar of the whale-boat then when thus hung in hangsman nooses and like the six burghers of calais before king edward the six men composing the crew pull into the jaws of death with a halter around every neck as you may say perhaps a very little thought will now enable you to account for those repeated whaling disasters some few of which are casually chronicled of this man or that man being taken out of the boat by the line and lost for when the line is darting out to be seated in the boat it is like being seated in the midst of a manifold whizzings of a steam engine in full play when every flying beam and shaft and wheel is grazing you it is worse for you cannot sit motionless in the heart of these perils because the boat is rocking like a cradle and you are pitched one way and the other without the slightest warning and only by a certain self-adjusting buoyancy and simultaneousness of volition and action can you escape being made a mazeppa of and run away with where the all-seeing sun himself could never pierce you out again as the profound calm which only apparently precedes and prophesies of the storm is perhaps more awful than the storm itself for indeed the calm is but the wrapper and envelope of the storm and contains in itself as the seemingly harmless rifle holds the fatal powder and the ball and the explosion so the graceful repose of the line as it silently serpentines about the oarsmen before being brought into actual play this is a thing which carries more of true terror than any other aspect of this dangerous affair but why say more all men live enveloped in whale lines all are born with halters round their necks but it is only when caught in the swift sudden turn of death that mortals realize the silent subtle ever-present perils of life and if you are be a philosopher though seated in the whaleboat you would not at heart feel one whit more of terror than though seated before you your evening fire with a poker and not a harpoon by your side sixty one 
Stub kills a whale. If to Starbuck, the apparition of the squid was a thing of portents to Quakeweg, it was quite a different object. When you see him, quid, said the savage, honing his harpoon in the bow of his hoisted boat, then you quick see him, parm well. The next day was exceedingly still and sultry, and with nothing special to engage them, the Pequod's crew could hardly resist the spell of sleep induced by such a vacant sea, for this part of the Indian Ocean, through which we then were voyaging, is not what whalemen call a lively ground. That is, it affords fewer glimpses of porpoises, dolphins, flying fish, and other vivacious denizens of more stirring waters than those off the Rio de la Plata, or the inshore ground off Peru. It was my turn to stand at the foremast head, and with my shoulders leaning against the slackened royal shrouds to and fro, I idly swayed in what seemed an enchanted air. No resolution could withstand it in the dreamy mood, losing all consciousness. At last my soul went out of my body, though my body still continued to sway as a pendulum, will long after the power which first moved it is withdrawn. Air, forgetfulness, altogether came over me. I had noticed that the seamen at the main and mizzen mastheads were already drowsy, so that at last all three of us lifelessly swung from the spars, and for every swing that we made there was a nod from below from the slumbering helmsman. The waves, too, nodded their indolent crests, and across the wide trance of the sea, east nodded to west, and the sun over all. Suddenly bubbles seemed bursting beneath my closed eyes. Like vices, my hands grasped the shrouds. Some invisible gracious agency preserved me, and with a shock I came back to life. And lo, close under our lee, not forty fathoms off, a gigantic sperm whale lay rolling in the water like the capsized hull of a frigate, his broad glossy back of an Ethiopian, Ethiopian hue, glistening in the sun rays like a mirror but lazily undulating in the through of the sea and ever and anon tranquilly spouting his vapory jet the whale looked like a portly burger smoking his pipe of a warm afternoon but that pipe poor whale was thy last as if struck by some enchanter's wand the sleepy ship and every sleeper in it all at once started into wakefulness and more than a score of voices from all parts of the vessel simultaneously with the three notes from aloft shouted forth the accustomed cry as the great fish slowly and regularly spouted the sparkling brine into the air. Clear away the boats! Luff! cried Ahab. And obeying his own order, he dashed the helm before down before the helmsman could handle the spokes. The sudden exclamations of the crew must have alarmed the whale, and ere the boats were down, majestically turning, he swam away to the leeward, but with such a steady tranquility, and making so few ripples as he swam, that, thinking after all, he might not as yet be alarmed. Ahab gave orders that not an oar should be used, and no man must speak but in whispers. So seated, like Ontario Indians, on the gunwales of the boats, we swiftly but silently paddled along, the calm not admitting of the noiseless sails being set. Presently, as we thus glided in chase, the monster perpendicularly flitted his tail forty feet into the air, and then sank out of sight like a tower stallowed up. There go flukes, was the cry, an announcement immediately followed by Stubbs producing his match and igniting his pipe, for now a respite 
was granted. After the full interval of his sounding had elapsed, the whale rose again, and being now in advance of the smoker's boat, and much nearer to it than to any of the others, Stubb counted upon the honor of the capture. It was obvious now that the whale had at length become aware of his pursuers. All silence of cautiousness was therefore no longer of use. Paddles were dropped and oars came loudly into play, and still puffing his pipe, Stubb cheered on his crew to the assault. Yes, a mighty change had come over the fish. All alive to his jeopardy, he was going head out to that part obliquely projecting from the mad yeast which he brewed. Footnote. It will be seen in some other place of what a very light substance the entire interior of the sperm whale's enormous head consists. Though apparently the most massive, it is by far the most buoyant part about him, so that with ease he elevates it in the air and invariably does so when going at his utmost speed. Besides, such is the breadth of the upper part of the front of his head, and such the tapering cutwater formation of the lower part, that by obliquely elevating his head, he thereby may be said to transform himself from a bluff-bowed sluggish galliot into a sharp-pointed New York pilot boat. End of footnote. Start her! Start her, my man! Don't hurry yourselves, take plenty of time, but start her, start her like thunderclaps, that's all, cried Stubb, sputtering out the smoke as he spoke. Start her, now give him the long and strong stroke. Tashtego, start her, Tash, my boy, start her. All keep cool, keep cool, cucumbers is the word. Easy, easy. Only start her like grim death and grinning devils, and raise the buried dead perpendicular out of the graves, boys. That's all. Start her. Woohoo! Way he! Screamed the gay hatter in reply, raising some old war whoop to the skies as every oarsman in the strained boat involuntarily bounced forward with the one tremendous leading stroke with the eager Indian grave. Which the eager Indian gave. But his wild screams were answered by others quite as wild. Kee-hee! Kee-hee! yelled Dagoo, straining forwards and backwards on his seat like a pacing tiger in his cage. Kala! Kolo! howled Quig-Quig, as if smacking his lips over a mouthful of Grenadius steak. And thus, with oars and yells, the keels cut the sea. Meanwhile, Stubb, retaining his place in the van, still encouraged his men to the onset, all the while puffing the smoke from his mouth like desperados. They tugged and they strained till the welcome cry was heard: "Stand up, Testago! Give it to him!" The harpoon was hurled. "Stern all!" The oarsmen backed water. The same moment, something went hot and hissing along every one of their wrist. It was the magical line. An instant before, Stubb had swiftly caught two additional turns with it round the loggerhead, whence, by reason of its increased rapid circlings, a hempen blue smoke now jetted up and mingled with the steady fumes from his pipe. As the line passed round and round the loggerhead, so also, just before reaching that point, it blisteringly passed through and through both of Stubb's hands, from which the hand cloths or squares of quilted canvas, sometimes worn at these times, had accidentally dropped. It was like holding an enemy's sharp two-edged sword by the blade, and that enemy all the time striving to wrest it out of your clutch. What the line? What the line? cried Stubb to the tub oarsman him seated by the tub, whoa, snatching off his hat, dashed the sea water into it. Footnote. Partly to show the indispensableness of this act, it may be here stated that in 
the old Dutch fishery, a mop was used to dash the running line with water. In many other ships, a wooden piggin, or baler, is set apart for that purpose. Your hat, however, is the most convenient. End of footnote. More turns were taken, so dashed the sea water into it. More turns were taken so that the line began holding its place. The boat now flew through the boiling water like a shark, all fins. Stubb and Tashtego here changed places stem for stern, a staggering business truly in that rocking commotion. From the vibrating line extending the entire length of the upper part of the boat, and from its now being more tight than a harp string, you would have thought the craft had two keels, one cleaving the water and the other the air, as the boat churned on through both opposing elements at once. A continual cascade played at the bows a ceaseless whirling eddy in their wake, and at the slightest motion from within, even but of the little finger, the vibrating, cracking craft canted over her spasmodic gunwale into the sea. Thus they rushed, each man with might and main clinging to his seat to prevent being tossed to the foam, and the tall form of Tashtego at the steering oar, crouching almost double in order to bring down his in center of gravity. Whole Atlantics and Pacifics seemed past as they shot on their way, till at length the whale somewhat slackened his fight. Haul in! Haul in! cried Stubb to the bowsman and facing round towards the whale, all hands began pulling the boat up to him, while yet the boat was being towed on. Soon, ranging up by his flag, Stubb firmly planting his knee in the clumsy cleat, darted dart after dart into the flying fish at the word of command, the boat alternately sterning out of the way of the whale's horrible wallow and then ranging up for another fling. The red tide now poured from all sides of the monster like brooks down a hill. His tormented body rolled not in brine but in blood, which bubbled and seethed for furlongs behind in their wake. The slanting sun, playing upon this crimson pond in the sea, sent back its reflection into every face, so that they all glowed to each other like red men. And all the while, jet after jet of white smoke was agonizingly shot from the spiracle of the whale, and vehement puff after puff from the mouth of the excited headsman, as at every dart, hauling in upon his crooked lance, by the line attached to it. Stubb straightened it again and again, by a few rapid blows against the gunwale, then again and again sent it into the whale. Pull up! Pull up! he now cried to the bowsman, as the waning whale relaxed in his wrath. Pull up! Close to! And the boat rang along the fish's flank. When reaching far over the bow, Stubb slowly churned his long, sharp lance into the fish and kept it there, carefully churning and churning, as if cautiously seeking to feel after some gold which that the whale might have swallowed, and which he was fearful of breaking ere he could hook it out. But that gold watch he sought was the innermost life of the fish. And now it is struck, for starting from him, trance into that unspeakable thing called his flurry, the monster horribly wallowed in his blood, overwrapped himself in impenetrable, mad boiling spray, so that the imperiled craft, instantly dropping astern, had much ado blindly to struggle out from that frenzied twilight into the clear air of the day. And now abating in his flurry, the whale once more rolled out into view, surging from side to side, 
spasmodically dilating and contracting his spout hole with sharp, cracking, agonized respirations. At last, gush after gush of clotted red gore, as if it had been the purple lees of red wine, shot into the frightened air, and falling back again, ran dripping down his motionless flanks into the sea. His heart had burst. "'He's dead, Mr. Stubb,' said Dagoo. "'Yes, both pipes smoked out.' And withdrawing his own from his mouth, Stubb scattered the dead ashes over the water, and for a moment stood thoughtfully eyeing the vast corpse he had made." Sixty-two. The Dart. A word concerning an incident in the last chapter. According to the invariable usage of the fishery, the whaleboat pushes off from the ship, with the headsman or whale killer as temporary steersman, and the harpooner or whale fastener pulling the foremost or the one known as the harpooner oar. Now it needs a strong, nervous arm to strike the first iron into the fish, for often, in what is called a long dart, the heavy implement has to be flung to the distance of twenty or thirty feet. But however prolonged and exhausting the chase, the harpooner is expected to pull his oar meanwhile to the uttermost, Indeed, he is expected to set an example of superhuman activity to the rest, not only by incredible rowing, but by repeated loud and interpreted exclamations, and what it is to keep shouting at the top of one's compass, while all the other muscles are strained and half-started. That what that is none know but those who have tried it. For one, I cannot bow very heartily and work very recklessly at one and the same time. In this straining, bowling state, then, with his back to the fish, all at once the exhausted harpooner hears the excited cry, Stand up and give it to him! He now has to drop and secure his oar, turn around on his center, halfway, seizes harpoon from the crotch, and with what little strength may remain, he essays to pitch it somehow into the whale. No wonder, taking the whole fleet of whalemen in a body, that out of fifty fair chances for a dart, not five are successful. No wonder that so many hapless harpooners are madly cursed and disrated. No wonder that some of them actually burst their blood vessels in the boat. No wonder that some sperm whalemen are absent for years with four barrels. No wonder that too many ship owners whaling is but a losing concern, for it is the harpooner that makes the voyage, and if you take the breath out of his body, how can you expect to find it there when he most wanted it? Again, if the dark be successful, then at the second critical instant, that is, when the whale starts to run, the boatheader and harpooner likewise start to running fore and aft to the imminent jeopardy of themselves and everyone else. It is then they change places, and the headsman, the chief officer of the little craft, takes his proper station in the bows of the boat. Now I care not who maintains the contrary, but all this is both foolish and unnecessary. The headsman should stay in the bows from first to last. He should both dart the harpoon and the lance, and no rowing whatever should be expected of him, except under circumstances obvious to any fisherman. I know that this would sometimes involve a slight loss of speed in the chase, but long experience in various whalesmen of, mere, uh, of more than one nation has convinced me that in the vast majority of failures in the fishery, it has not by any means been so much the speed of the whale as the before-described exhaustion of the harpooner that has caused them. 
To ensure the greatest efficiency in the dark, the harpooners of the world must start to their feet from out of idleness and not from out of toil. Sixty-three. The Crotch Out of the trunk the branches grow, out of them the twigs sow, in productive subjects grow the chapters. The crotch alluded to on a previous page describes independent mention. It is a notched stick of a peculiar form, some two feet in length, which is perpendicularly inserted into the starboard gunwale near the bow, for the purpose of furnishing a rest for the wooden extremity of the harpoon, whose other naked barbed end slopingly projects from the prow. Thereby the weapon is instantly at hand to its hurler, who snatches it up as readily as its rest as a backswoodsman swings his rifle from the wall. It is customary to have two harpoons reposing in the crotch, respectively called the first and second irons. But these two harpoons, each by its own cord, are both connected with the line, the object being this to dart them both, if possible, one instantly after the other into the same whale, so that if, in the coming drag, one should draw out, the other may still remain a hold. It is a doubling of the chances, but it very often happens that, owing to the instantaneous, violent, convulsive running of the whale upon receiving the first iron, it becomes impossible for the harpooner, however lightning-like in his movements, to pitch the second iron into him. Nevertheless, as the second iron is already connected with the line, and the line is running, hence that weapon must, at all events, be anticipatingly tossed out of the boat somehow and somewhere, else the most terrifying jeopardy would involve all hands. Tumble into the water, tumble into the water it accordingly is, in such cases, the spare coils of box line, mentioned in a preceding chapter, making this feat, in most instances, prudently practicable. But this critical act is not always unattended with the saddest and most fatal casualties. Furthermore, you must know that when the second iron is thrown overboard, it thenceforth becomes a dangling, sharp-edged terror, skittishly curvetting about both boat and whale, entangling the lines or cutting them and making a prodigious sensation in all directions. Nor, in general, is it possible to secure it again until the whale is fairly captured and a corpse. Consider now how it must be in the case of four boats all engaging one unusually strong, active, and knowing whale, when owing to these qualities in him, as well as to the thousand concurring accidents of such an audacious enterprise, eight or ten loose second irons may be simultaneously dangling about him, for, of course, each boat is supplied with several harpoons to bend on to the line, should the first one be ineffectually darted without recovery. All these particulars are faithfully narrated here, as they will not fail to elucidate several most important, however intricate, passages in scenes hereafter to be painted.